We'll, uh, my plan is, uh, I'm, I have to do the, the first uh, sort of opening session. Uh, some of you have attended Startup 101, might find the first session a little repetitive, okay? So a couple of you who have been here, I think, you've been here, yes. Ajay, you've been there. Anybody else? You've been there also, have you? Okay, anyway, so uh, my plan is that I'll uh, first, I'll just get into fundraising directly, okay? Um, very often we find that uh, some of the, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurs sometimes have difficulty moving from the project mode to the business mode. So I'll try to get it to that point. Uh, and following that, uh, the next session, uh, uh, Shrikanth will come in and uh, discuss more about, you know, how much money you need to raise, structure of a pitch, and, and so on, okay? So let's go directly. Um, for some of you who, oops, okay, something I did wrong. Yeah. So the, the first thing that we will get started with is just getting the basics right, okay? So all of you uh, are uh, doing some kind of tech or science, science or tech kind of a business. And very often, it's important to first understand that here we are building a business. Okay, and it's not about a project anymore, okay? And it's the business that you're raising money for, okay? And you have to present it as such. Hi, hey, come, please, right? So let's also ask the question, why are you in business? Okay, and I want you to do some thinking around it. Uh, I'll move a little fast in this session, okay? Uh, so bear with me, but we'll come back. We can discuss it in the afternoon, some other parts as well. Uh, and what kind of a business you wish to develop is also something you need to think about, okay? Not all businesses are necessarily those which are going to be driven by venture capital firms, okay? So you might have your own thinking about it, so think about it a little bit in terms of what you're trying to uh, build. And uh, also be clear of why is the funder or investor actually giving you money, okay? Uh, Sometimes, you know, we get in this, uh, very often entrepreneurs and innovators get into this mode of thinking, supporting my idea. Well, they are there, there to make money, okay? Let's just face it and let's just focus on how they can make money if they're investing in your company, okay? So I'll start with that. Just a couple, this I'm gonna move fast, some of you have seen it. So in my view, a business is about creating an engine. Okay, that's taking some inputs in and putting out some value added outputs, right? So we are all in the business of building that engine, right? Instead of thinking of yourself as the prime mover, as an individual developing all these different uh, uh, ideas, think about building that engine now, right? And the engine, one component is you, but then there are many other parts to that engine, right? That includes your team, that includes the facility you set up, that includes the know-how you will build, the IP that you will create, and all of those parts. So now, let's focus on that engine, and question is, what are we building out there? So a simple way is, you know, you think of a factory, okay? A factory that encapsulates your, just for, the, for simplicity I'm saying, which encapsulates your idea, it's the business, and then that factory is that organization or the engine that you're building, okay? It's independent of you. Whether you're there or not at some point, it should still flourish. It should deliver on the vision that you are trying to deliver at the end of the day, okay? And you're in it to do that, okay? This mind shift is a little, is important for some of you who are still in the project mode, especially those who are in the early stage, okay? We are talking here of that engine, not of the project, okay? So keep that in mind. So the bottom line in all businesses is this graph out here, okay? What you have to do is there will be inputs into the business and at the end of it, there have to be potential rewards. Rewards for you also as an entrepreneur. You're looking at not only financial rewards, but delivering on the vision that you want to you know, deliver. And there will be some investment required and there will be some potential reward at the end. And every business has to answer this question. What is the final potential reward, okay? How much is this investment and in the red that you're going into, okay? And finally, how certain are you that this graph will pan out, 
right? Which is very important, by the way. All of us make those predictions, but at the end of it, uh, it's also about how certain are you that it's going to happen. And that certainty depends upon your own credibility as an entrepreneur, you, what all you have done so far, what all you have de-risked, what all you have proven, okay? All of those things come to tell an investor that you're fairly certain this graph will pan out, okay? Including your market research, including all the costing that you did, how certain you're about cost, price, all of those things, okay? And that's what we are progressively heading towards, how to make it more and more certain. But before that, you have to have the story, which is that there is an investment and there is a reward at the end of the road, okay? And what is that is what you have to articulate to your investors, okay? Okay. So any business, there are key points that to remember. All businesses solve some problem, okay, or meets an unmet need, right? So this is an essential recipe. You have to have it in your, whatever you're saying, okay? It has to have a revenue model around that need, right? Some kind of a revenue model, and it has to be sustainable. All businesses, you will find that this is essential. So when you think about your business, think about these three aspects that there is a story around each of this, which is a credible story, a truthful story. Okay. Sustainable, what does sustainable mean? Sustainable means that your expenses can be met, right? I'm going to be brief here. Uh, a mechanism to, ha you have a mechanism to handle your cash flow problems, okay? You have a way by which you can take care of situations where you run out of cash, Remember that most companies close down because they get they are insolvent, not because they're bankrupt, okay? That means they run out of cash, okay? Not because they don't have assets in the, in, in, uh, to, in the company. And the, a mechanism to power growth exists, okay? There has to be some way by which you can power that growth, right? Which you want to have in your company. You want to, you want to keep growing, right? And uh, profits and surpluses are clearly the simplest and the cleanest route to sustainability. Right? But in some situations where you might be looking at certain socially relevant areas, there may be other ways. But you know, I can tell you for sure that even there, this is the best way to do it. Okay? Profits and surpluses are the best way to sustain and grow your company. Okay. Some of you might be motivated by social themes. That's also important. But when we think, think about social themes, for us, Amul is like the benchmark. It's a profitable entity. It makes profits. It, it, a lot of farmers benefit from it, dairy farmers. A lot of consumers benefit from it. Its reach is wide, impact is large, all of it. But it is still a business, okay? It still has to solve a problem. It still has to have a revenue model, and it still has to be sustainable. Don't forget that, okay? Because uh, some of you will come from an impact perspective, from a social enterprise perspective, but it's still important that this has to be met, okay? Okay. For social enterprises, you have so-called multiple bottom lines very often, right? What does that mean? When people are talking about the y-axis besides money, you're also often talking about impact, okay? And you have to demonstrate that as well. You have to have measures to... You have to have ways of monitoring impact and then reporting that as well to the, all the stakeholders that are concerned. It is not that the money is not important. It's, it is also required. In fact, when you're doing social entrepreneurship, you're actually, <coughs> in my opinion, taking on two horses rather than one, right? So it's not trivial. I mean, it, it's not easy necessarily, okay? You have to ride both the horses if you want to uh, be successful in social enterprises. So in social enterprises, we think it's, it's no different than any other ent enterprise, but there'll be multiple bottom lines, and usually you address a problem that recognizes a social need, appeals to our humanity, okay? And therefore, you are leveraging goodwill to arrange your resources, besides just a profit motive, okay? And that could be money, could be employees, could be team members, could be customers, all of these are resources going into that building, that engine, right? And you're leveraging goodwill to do arrange all of that. Perhaps the investors will seek a let, little lower return or be more patient, but nonetheless, it's a business, okay? At the end of the day, you have to show that you are going to run a profitable business, okay? 
It may be frugal, may be inclusive, but not necessarily. Okay, these are specific cases of social uh, entrepreneurship. Startups, in my view, or what you call as entrepreneurial businesses, have a few interesting aspects to it. One is that the opportunity that you're pursuing is very often much larger than the resources in your hand. Okay, that means you're not concerned as much about what money you have today and what you can do with it. You're presenting a picture and opportunity which is much larger. There is a larger vision and then you're raising money to address that particular opportunity, right? That's how if you look at mom and pop shops and so on, they differ in that because they're just looking at what's available with them and they build the shops, right? And they work with that as a business. Here you're thinking of a much larger vision and you need to do that. The reason I'm telling you this is because that vision has to be presented to investors and other stakeholders, okay? It is not about how much money you have and what you can do with it. It is about what is it that you wish to achieve and where are you headed, okay? And you're seeking other people's help to take you there, okay? And because of this, just by this nature itself, it's scalable, right? You're aspiring for something big. It has to be scalable, right? So you have to look at scalable ideas. Usually the opportunity looks very small initially. Okay, so don't be surprised if you think it's the biggest thing in the world and nobody else agrees with you. Okay? Uh, it, that's how entrepreneurship works, right? Opportunities look small and eventually you know, shape up into something much bigger. And therefore, for most of you, the journey will be lonely. So don't be too surprised when you pitch to many people and many will be skeptical, okay? It's okay, Your, the idea is to listen to all of them, gather all their questions and find answers for them, okay? It is not about fighting them out. It's a waste of your time, right? Instead, I think just be prepared that the journey is going to be lonely, okay? That doesn't mean you have to be foolish. You have to accept those points which are valid, but you have to address those as we go along, okay? And it's usually built around some kind of an innovation. It's technology innovation or business process innovation. And you'll also find that the innovation capacity is built into the company, okay? Many of you will be also innovators. Many of you will respond to changes that are happening. In many companies which have, say, taken technology and then don't innovate, they stagnate over a period of time. Here you're talking about a situation where things are changing around you so much, things are so fluid that you have to keep innovating. That means it has to be built in into the team. That means the innovation team, your team, entrepreneurial team has to have the innovator in-house. Okay? Okay. So there are many different types of businesses. These are the common ones you hear about, right? One category which I call foresight businesses okay, are the ones which look into the future. They're looking at a theme which is a little ahead in the game, right? And it's in a fast changing mo uh, world. And there's, you need to get there fast and often be first. And these kind of businesses are what, you know, the venture capital guys like, okay? Hmm? They're looking at fast moving kind of ideas. They want you to scale very rapidly. They want to attack a problem before others get there so that they are ready with a solution when somebody with a lot of money comes to buy them out. Okay, that's how they look at it, right? But then can, there can be other companies, which I told you like multiple bottom line companies and there's a whole category of investors called impact investors who are willing to look at that uh, category and you can tap those if you think you have multiple bottom lines to show. But some other businesses also exist. For example, what, this, what are called lifestyle businesses, okay? If you have modest ambitions, you're just looking at yourself and building around you, like a clinic, a doctor's clinic, okay? Or a small pathology lab, unlike, a, say, a Dr. Lal's path labs, okay? If you're doing that, that's a self sort of financed operation usually, right? Usually investors are not interested in investing in such businesses. In your case, in some of you guys, if you're thinking of a design house, okay, or an invention company, keeps coming up with new inventions, you come under that category, so be careful about that. It's not easy to raise money if you're coming up with multiple ideas, one after another, just to keep going, right? If you take that one idea ahead all the way and scale it up, then you're more interesting to an investor. But if you're going to be 
a design house or an invention company and so on, it's very likely that you will be a self-financed business and you have to look at organic growth, growing on your own steam. Investors won't necessarily touch you. And if you have established revenue models, you're closer to uh, the market, especially some who might at some point decide to focus on services, you may be eligible for bank funding, okay? Usually banks like very established models. They are not the ones who are taking risk, okay? They are primarily funding growth, okay? They know that this is how it works and it's all established, your revenue model is established and then they are willing to uh, step in, okay? So usually for most early stage companies, that's not an option. So you need to think where you stand out here, okay? Which kind of a company are you building? So in track one, we are, we are looking at people who have not yet decided, <laughs> okay? Track two, we are looking at people who are probably in the first two segments, okay? In, in this uh, base camp. Okay, so again, just to repeat, so venture cap investors, uh, I'm just simplifying it a little bit. These are the kind of companies that you would often find. Rapidly scalable entrepreneurial businesses growing fast in valuations, okay? And the second would be startups <coughs> who are building valuable assets, okay? That can be sold to others, others who are very keen to own it or co-own it, okay? And uh, in most early stage invest, in the case in, in, in India, in most, the case of most early stage investors, uh, exits come from late stage investors or mergers and acquisitions, okay? IPOs and so on are very rare. Right? So I'll show you some numbers as well. So remember that it's the valuation game that people are playing. So eventually it comes down to saying, I put in this much, how much is it valuable today? How, how valuable is it today? Okay, after a few years. Okay, uh, this, I, just to quickly tell you, uh, all of you uh, saw the Flipkart's uh, story unraveling uh, last year. I just want to point out that uh, in their case, you, you, you must have noticed that their job was, if you look back, it was primarily to build an asset, okay? They were essentially capturing market share, to put it a little bluntly, for Walmart, <laughs> okay? All right? Indian market share, capture it at 150% growth rate every year on year, okay? And once you have that asset, you have that piece of jewelry in front of you, there are a lot of people willing to buy it, okay? It was not necessarily the full story that they were trying to do. It was just an asset that they were building, right? That's another approach. That's the second approach that I told you. I have nothing against it. It's perfectly fine, okay? But that's another way you can look at it, and certain businesses are like that. Please remember that they started when it was not really that sexy, that area. Uh, the story that they pitched from the very beginning was a very large one. That's why they could raise money and command those valuations. So although they were selling books, the story was about e-commerce as a whole, right? And capturing market space in India, being one of the largest players. And they stuck to that story, right? Please note that their strength was execution, right? Every year, they could grow 150%, right? That's not easy, right? that executing it is the key there. Valuation was determined primarily by revenues, right, and volumes, and not by profitability, okay? Some people think that you have to be profitable very early. That's not necessarily true, okay? Mm -hmm. Founders did not worry about dilution, right? Sachin Bansal at maybe, what, 6% Srikant? 6%, right, about one point something billion dollars worth. They focused more on valuation and not necessarily on dilution, okay, of their share in the company diluting. This is another very common problem we see with many scientists, engineers who are really trying to grapple with this whole idea of losing control of their company. But here is an example of how, how you can actually create value, okay? And, uh, Clearly, if Sachin Bansal starts another company, there will be many people willing to fund it, right? Once you have a track record of showing that you can deliver uh, value, and that for an investor, you can create value. Incidentally, I, SoftBank, which came in a few months before, 
maybe about eight months before, I think six to eight months before, with a two billion kind of an investment dollars, went out <laughs> with within eight months with uh, I think 1.5 to two times the amount. Okay, now clearly you know you'll be darlings of investors if you're in that boat, right? Okay, but please remember that in this graph out here, Flipkart is still here, right? It's not profitable. It's still at the bottom. It's yet to bottom out, and still it's so valuable, right? So keep this in mind when you're thinking about your business as well. Corporate investors are a different set of, different breed of animals, okay? Uh, so when they are looking at this, and many of you might get interest from corporate investors, you have to remember that some of them might be looking at products and services that indirectly grow uh, their corporate cash cows. For example, a pharma company would may invest in diagnostics because more, uh, where more the diagnosis of a certain disease, more will the, be the sales of a particular drug, right? So they may do that. Uh, or a company might ha invest in order to create an option to be in a space which they don't know how it will pan out because very often we have seen entrepreneurial companies come out of the blue and destroy the um, uh, the whole market space changes, right? So they will come at it as an option. They're just seeking an option. For them, that investment is just a ticket to be in the game, okay? Nothing more than that. They are, of course, sometimes looking at potential acquisition targets for their own businesses, and it could be new verticals as well, or uh, potential acquisition to diversify their own businesses. Diversification as opposed to just building new uh, product lines. They may also be looking to own the technology to either supplement their own or even kill the competition. In the sense, it could be killing the competition or killing your technology also. Okay? If you're okay with that, you can sell. That's fine. But re be prepared for that. Sorry for the spelling mistakes out here. <laughs> right? And uh, of course, there can be many other strategic advantages. So one of the general rules is when you're going with a strategic or a corporate investor, think through carefully about what is their game plan so that you have thought through the entire length of how your holding will pan out in the business over time. It's not enough to look at them. Don't look at them just like any other financial investor. Financial investor has a very simple agenda. He's putting money in and trying to get out. Okay, And it's a financial game. Strategic investors have multiple games out there playing, right? So you have to know how it will pan out over a period of time. Even if they are minority investors, you need to know what will be their say on the rest of the story. Will they allow other investors to come in? Okay? Will they be the will they want to buy out the rest? If so, let's figure it out right now. Okay? Okay. <coughs> um, when you're looking at uh, an important part of raising money is to understand your investor, right? After all, uh, you can imagine that, uh, you know, if you're a painter, you're looking for the guy who really values your painting. So you want to be able to read who is that person who really values your painting, right? It's the same here. Hmm? So you have to figure out what is it, who values it, and what are they looking for, right? So what are, what are the results you can deliver for them? Is it financial? Is it impact? Okay, and if you're sitting on an asset, you should clearly know who values that asset the most. When you you must have heard of services companies who are bought out just because their ASCII asset is their workforce. Okay, they have hundred people specialized in this area, which another company just wants to have as part of their team. Right, that's also an asset. Or you have a plant, which does X Y Z, and somebody sees a value in doing A B C with it. They don't tell you that, of course. They see that you can use it, so they buy that asset and use it for something else which they value, right? In all of this, there will be some information asymmetry. And you have to, you have to try to sort of climb over that and figure out what exactly is the reason for that interest. It also helps you identify investors that way. Some people build businesses after understanding that need and then building that asset just to serve that need. Okay, so you know that this large company, three years down the road, is going to need this, and let me build it today. And in IT space, it's very common. 
services space, it's very common, right? That you build it today so that an HP or a Google buys you out, right? And you're doing it only for that purpose. And of course, you are an option that they wish to retain, okay? They don't know how this technology is gonna pan out tomorrow and they wanna just be in that space as well. So if you're raising money, find people who value, who see value in your company, right? And for that, you have to go and meet, go and research, go and uh, various places to try and figure out who is it that's gonna value it and why, right? And if you want to, and you have to of course convince them of the value that you can deliver value and typical things which you have to look for is at what ticket size they're gonna participate. That means what are the levels of investment that they are willing to do or capable of doing or are, are, are known to do, okay? Uh, and what is the potential benefit for them? And what is the level of certainty with which you can deliver that benefit? Okay? Okay. So this is the story that you'll have to build at some point. I'm sure Shrikant will go into it in further detail. But just keep this in mind, right? You will notice that uh, many of you, if you're coming from BIRAC kind of uh, projects, right? I'm shifting you right down to actually the story of making money, right? So let's talk about that. In this base camp, let's shift the focus there and let's build that plan out, okay? So what's it? So there's some money to be invested. What's the ticket size? What is the instrument, right? Instrument means is it equity, is it debt, whatever, convertible debts. And what will one get back after that? How much, when, how will exit happen, and how certain are you that it will happen? Okay, the story you're claiming is going to happen, right? This will be a very central part of the story that you're going to pitch, okay. Coming to funding landscape quickly. In funding landscapes, you have to remember that you have to think through not just your immediate funding. Sometimes we are very opportunistic that we see a pocket of funding and we try to grab it, saying let's just do it, right? But you also have to think what comes next. Is there a next funding available to take it ahead, right? So we think of it like this, that there's a pond out there, there's stepping stones, you walk in, the Bayrak Biotech Ignition Grant was the first stone you got in, and then you see that there are three stones ahead missing, right? You don't want to do that, right? So think about what are those three stones ahead. So in this base camp, please also think through that. What will be possible stones in the, f in, the, in the path ahead, okay? Besides the first round of funding that you might have got. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's a funding database online which all of you can use. Uh, we to this year we will be trying to improve this significantly but we have quite a lot of grant, debt, uh, equity kind of uh, funding sources available here. Uh, just a quick uh, roundup. So, you can look at a variety of different funding pockets, you know, funding agencies. Of course, incidentally, this happens to be the biggest still, which is friends, family, and fools who are willing to bet on your story, right? No matter how much uh, noise uh, uh, venture cap make, right? It's still a very small fraction of the money that goes into businesses, right? So we should not forget that. So please leverage that, right? And they can be crowdfunding sites, and of course, customer money is the best kind of money. If you have a product to sell, and you can get pre-orders, and so on and so forth, that's great, right? Because that, that, that's the cheapest kind of money that you can get, okay? Um, and revenue from sales. And then these, which we usually talk about, the ones in red, uh, are the ones we will probably focus on, especially in track two in the current uh, uh, base camp. Angel investors, seed funds, venture funds, impact investors and corporate or strategic investors, okay? These are the guys who might come in to put money in your company and usually will take a stake, okay, in some form or the other, or it could be a CCD of some form which, or debt which converts. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that, how do you raise that kind of money will be a clear focus of uh, this base camp. Other than that, there can be banks, at a very late stage, private equity funds kick in and there can be a few others as well. For example, venture debt and so on that are coming up uh, in the, uh, you've seen that. 
the different fundraising buckets as well, right? And many of you are familiar with this. Very often, many of us in science and technology-based innovations, we start with the first bucket, which is R&D, pre-POC kind of money, right? Some of the people who are doing fellowships are in that space out there. And following that comes something like BIG. Uh, there is, of course, uh, Birax, AIR, Sparsh, SBRI, Nidhi Prayas, uh, PRISM, CSR, all of this usually fits in the second bracket where you're talking about proof of concept or basic prototype. CSR is a little less, and 3Fs is very common, of course. You do it with your own money, right? The next category, the functional prototypes and pilots, okay? That's where you can look at further uh, funding. Some of us are using SBRI. Some of us might get an opportunity, especially in the impact or the social in enterprise space to look at CSR and 3Fs again. And then product validation certification, uh, something like BIPP is also possible. For example, if you're doing clinical trials, okay, or you're doing certifications, advanced certifications, BIPP gives you funds, okay? Uh, Indo-US funds you quite a bit uh, over the whole range. Uh, there are at least three uh, venture center startups which have benefited from that. Um, angel and seed investments come in at this stage. Uh, some of the government seed funds, incubator-related seed funds, all of these kick in at this place out here. Unfortunately, the Ministry of Science and Technology funding, except for a couple of things, dries up at this stage. So there's no money, right? But the technology translation money is not meant for manufacturing, okay? Hmm? So manufacturing, in early stage manufacturing, you have to eventually end up going to angel, seed, early VC, and so on. And TDB offers it, uh, and uh, Tifax region are both loans, okay? There's no grant or soft funding uh, over there. Of course, the terms are a little softer than the commercial uh, lending. And then business scale up, very often, is all uh, commercial money, okay? So if you want to go all the way, you should be very clear that it's not enough to just focus on government funding, right? So you have to have a story of how you're going to raise this kind of money. And you have to think about the stepping stones ahead, not merely what you're doing today, but what's going to come in the future, okay? And have a path. So I hope in this base camp, you will chart that course out. You will say that I expect that in the next few years, five years, I'm going to be at this stage, at this point, I'll be at this, uh, I'll need this kind of a funding, okay? and maybe look and explore options. If you don't find it immediately, we'll at least keep that option, we'll at least keep searching for it, okay? But you should know that that funding is needed, okay? This is a rough uh, map uh, of uh, funding levels in India. The traditional ones are these. These still constitute a very large fraction, especially the family-funded companies. But many of us are first-generation entrepreneurs. We need help. And uh, that's where all this kicks in, okay? So the red ones here are from BIRAC. BIRAC uh, uh, comes, starts with fellowships, then the BIG Spursh kind of funding, SBRI somewhere here, BIPP later for the late stage. BIPP incidentally doesn't have a limit, but it's 50-50, okay? Hmm? You have to raise your half the money. And then there are these seed and leap kind of funds. Both of them are investments, okay? And uh, Bayrak has also come up with an ACE fund with other fund houses, which will come a little uh, later out here. And then DST has its own funding pockets out here. So some of you are in the very early stages might want to look at the soft funding options as well. But please keep in mind that the late stage in funding, which will come from financial investors, corporate investors, commercial investors, you will need to keep that in mind and you'll need to plan for that, okay? Um, so. This is a simplified model. Um, and if some of you have products and technologies which can go abroad, right, you can do that too, right? You can think of raising money in other countries, right? Today, with some of the international accelerators, it is possible to make your first move. But otherwise, you will have to find ways to reach out to potential mentors and others who can take you there to other uh, other destinations, be it Silicon Valley, be it Singapore, uh, be it any other place where you think you can raise money, okay? Okay, some quick data, and then I will close. This just, 
I don't want to push any given city, but I just thought I will, I will show you the reality, okay? And then you can decide for yourself what you wish to do, right? Um, there is a concentration of funding in different places, right? Um, by the way, when, I, when we talk about startup funding, this of course includes all the big guys also, okay? And uh, I will also show you the sectors are different. It, involve, it involve, includes the Swiggies, the Flipkarts, all of those. So you should uh, take some messages out of this, but not the wrong messages, <laughs> okay? Anyway, so clearly Bangalore seems to be the hub of, uh, uh, of startup funding, followed by New Delhi, NCR region. Mumbai and Pune follow closely, okay, together. Well, sorry for you guys who are working in the sciences, <laughs> but the bulk of the money that's being raised is happening in e-commerce still, consumer internet, mobile apps, services, okay? Uh, and healthcare and so on, by the way, this number is not bad, right? But that said, in proportion, it is small, including hardware, analytics, and so on, okay? This is some data uh, which also shows the deal values and the deal uh, volumes. Uh, it also interestingly shows growth rates, okay? And uh, this is data uh, uh, in 2017, okay? You can see this sudden spike in this telecom, okay? Consumer technology, and of course, even things like real estate, uh, there's quite a lot of investment that is going in. So these are all publicly available data, okay? I'm not saying that uh, healthcare and manufacturing. So we might have some here, we might have some here, some in energy, okay, and some in healthcare, right? In some of the companies that we are uh, interested in. <coughs> if you ask investors, if you went, since they are the buyers in a sense, right? They are the ones who are buying into your story, right? So if you ask them where do the opportunities lie, where do they see the highest investment activity, okay? Uh, I'm happy to say that healthcare features about third, okay? It's not bad at all. And I think it's growing. The interest is actually growing. So you're at a cusp right now, most probably. Uh, it's probably at a point where investor interest is going to significantly increase. Interesting thing is agribusiness has also been growing. Okay, the interest is growing. Um, energy environment is not that very high up in the list, okay? What is their perception on valuations? So most of them feel the valuations are too high and the next year it's going to go down, right? We'll see, <laughs> But this is the general perception that uh, people have. As far as angel investment goes, um, I just want to leave you with a few points, okay? I mean, this is, of course, overall data cannot be correlated directly to the domains which you are working in, but nonetheless, these are facts which you have to face, okay? So there, the, there are a bunch of individual investors who are acting on their own and not as part of a network, okay, who are the largest chunk of angel investment, okay? It's not the angel networks who are the biggest chunk. Of course, they might have their own preferences, okay, and many of them might be investing in uh, IT, e-commerce, and so on. So a bunch of these, for example, uh, have invested 425 investment in the last 10 years, and there's a whole cluster of startups around them, right? Each of them going in for multiple investments in multiple companies, right? Interestingly, this data is quite interesting. Uh, what I'm showing here is angel investments done along with funds, okay? and deals involving only angels. So the first message here is that many of the angel investors, right, are actually co-investing with a fund, okay? They may start on their own, but they are likely to bring in other people. So very savvy angel investors probably are closely tied up with other funds who they draw in into the company. Right? So it's important that when you are looking at raising investments, you also understand that angel investment has this nature, 
okay and it's important to connect to the right people as well okay second learning here this data shows that bulk of the angel investment is happening via individuals and not via networks okay hmm? so the various networks that are there are not the major uh, chunk of the angel investments okay if you go online there's a lot of data available and if you some of you want to do uh, the sebi site has a whole list of these uh, alternative investment vehicles okay and the different categories i just want to give you a glimpse of a few right all this data is freely available in the sebi site by the way uh, in aifs which is where all the venture funds are listed these are some categories okay uh, social venture funds venture capital fund sme fund and there's actually one more new subcategory called the angel fund okay for many of you at the early stages the one that's relevant for you is actually what is called the angel fund okay what they call vcf is actually very large okay they are not the ones that you will be dealing with so if you are going to look at companies search for uh, funds you might want to look at some of these listings okay there's substantial amount being invested but you have to know who is investing what and there are, there are other data sources available for that okay if you these are two sites by the way all this will be available to you online through a restricted site uh, which uh, will be announced immediately after this uh, session is over so uh, you will get some administrative announcements at that time so there is sebi site and for example the ivca indian venture capital association site okay you can actually get all these lists and you can see the numbers out here uh, these are very large actually uh, much larger than what you might see but hopefully 3 3 years 4 years down the road you might be some of you would be talking to these guys okay if you are successful in raising money and building valuations in your company okay i just want to point out that these numbers this is a quarter quarter number in crores okay it's pretty large right it's not small okay and of course if you look at foreign and in the in the larger venture investment space uh, the foreign component is larger okay than the indian component right so you can see that the fcis is much larger than the v indian vcs right no wonder that people end up registering in other countries right so you may need to think about that as well that as you grow you know the investor might require you that you are registering a company in singapore or us or whatever okay this uh, is just another quick data point um in uh, <coughs> in 2018 these were the five top vc funds i have some no numbers in the next slide which i want to show you so they're relevant to you guys uh, is bloom uh, axel partners sequoia idg and nexus okay and uh, total investment in the calendar 2017 about 13.5 billion dollars about 885 deals of course the large numbers will be skewed in the direction of a few okay so be clear about that but this is interesting which is by the i'm showing you this because this kind of data you can get on your own online okay so when you do your research for different types of investors you should be able to get this right uh, there's no excuse for you not doing your homework okay you can see here interestingly bloom ventures has deals even in the 50k to 300k size 50k is 35 lakhs okay so it's not that they are not looking at smaller deals okay but there'll be very few it not it, it, there are only 11 deals say by bloom ventures in the in this sample space which is uh, put up out here which is for half huh? half the year okay um axel partners goes much higher right sequoia has different ranges out here going from about 70 lakhs right up to a much larger stage and sometimes investing is also about something like a relay race somebody puts in money the next guy is already looking out to invest in that same one and so on okay so it's once you get in the relay race there is a chance that the baton will be handed over to another investor later okay so you have to remember that as well so when you look at investors remember also to see where are they handing over the baton next okay 
Uh, again, some of these numbers are quite, you can have a look at some of these numbers, right from $1 million. I think these are numbers which some of you may be able to raise in a few years, okay? If you're in the early stages, few years, late, little later stages, maybe even now, okay? So, um, the, the, this again, of course, is, uh, just talks about the number of deals and the uh, number of amou amounts that are coming in. But I just wanted to also tell you that there's also data available that different funds focus on different sectors, okay? So for example, these here it's consumer tech, financial services, industrial goods and services, tech, media, telecom, health, retail, and so on. And you can see who is investing in that space, right? Clearly SoftBank is focused a little bit here, right? Temasek is okay do, going into health. Carlyle is okay going into health and so on, right? So this data is also available and you can actually go and try and see. Um, so when you're networking in the investor community, in the angel investor community with mentors, you may want to keep all of these considerations in uh, mind as well. So uh, this data uh, it shows that majority of the deals, let's just focus on this data, calendar year 17, majority of the investments happened at stakes which are less than 25%, okay? That means it's a minority stake that investors came in for, okay? And that's the case in majority of the investments. Sometimes people think uh, they get offers of people who are offering to almost take over the company. Uh, just think through it in terms of what kind of a deal you want and what is the future for your company, okay? IPOs and exits. Um, by the way, in, uh, in, in India, there's now, there are SME exchanges available, okay? But unfortunately, you can be on those exchanges only if you have a track record of profitability, okay? So minimum three-year profitability is required and there is a certain minimum fundraise that you are doing out there. But I just want to show you this data because if you can, by the some of you might get into profitability, maybe even because of services, whatever it is, you might still be able to hit that. Uh, you can see that there were about 104 issues, an amount was about only uh, 1,400 crores, right? Which means if you average it out, okay, it's pretty small, right? Under 15 crores, not bad, right? There is a thought that sometimes the public markets give you better price discovery, okay? Uh, well, it's true or not, that depends on how well you sell it, <laughs> but there have been smaller fundraisers also in the SME exchanges. But many of you who are in the red might not be able to get there until you become profitable, okay? But this is an option which is available. And uh, of course, that said, mm. much of the IPO action happens outside India, right? So if you want to be in this space, if you want to get to an IPO, at some point you have to start looking at foreign markets, okay? And, for, and it's no surprise, therefore, that all these big firms that you see, uh, you hear of, are, have registered entities in other markets, okay? Hmm? NASDAQ leading the front, uh, and, uh, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, and US being on the top, uh, Singapore, not bad, Hong Kong being very high up, Shanghai being very high up, Shenzhen being very high up. I know that uh, there are companies in India who are looking carefully at Hong Kong, Singapore, and the US, okay? Primarily, am I right, Shikhan? Yeah? So these are primarily the places that people are looking at. And uh, is it a popular route in India? Well, at what stage is a different matter? But this can be a story, but m please remember actually this data shows it well, is that if this is 2016 and uh, these are exits, modes of exit, okay? You can see that the bulk of the exit happened through strategic sales and secondary sale, okay? Right, that means it was not an IPO, it was not a public market sale, it was bought out by another company or there was a secondary sale, another investor coming in and buying it out, okay? Uh, so these are the facts, right? But overall, the returns that these guys are making is not that great, huh? So another number here, that of the 24 billion, 
I mean, out of a sample, 24 billion exited at a value of about 43 billion. Okay, so they are in the positive. Exits happen to an extent. They are in the positive. The multiple is about only 1.8. Okay, and not necessarily very very spectacular as a whole. But when you are looking at one company, you know. The investor doesn't know which is that one star company which is going to make them money and others will fail, right? So they would expect you to look at multiples, right? And those multiples is one of the tasks we have set for you in this venture-based camp. That means you have to try and figure out, we'll give you the tools, try and figure out what will be the progression and how will the share multiples happen in your business. Okay, and what is the story you will tell to an investor that five years from now, I hope that your one million dollar investment will be ten million dollars. Okay, and does it excite him or not depends on his appetite. Yeah, and what else he is doing. Okay, so a couple of final points. I'm on time, right? Okay. So uh, for many of you, uh, um, if you are um, most of your startups, so I leave out the first part, but POC and prototyping. You know, these are the kind of options that all of you are looking at. Some of you who have done something and want further support, you can still look at this segment a little bit. SBRI requires you to put in some part of your money yourself, okay? Um, and even PRISM, phase one. Um, if you're doing pilot, scale up, validation, trial, certifications, you might want to look at these kind of funds, including SBRI, BIPP, some of the other ones first, uh, phase two, Nidhi seed support scheme, Bayrak seed support scheme, uh, Angel and VC at that stage. If it's manufacturing, sales, revenue, business model dev demonstrated, you've already demonstrated all of that, then chances are that many of the Ministry of Science and Technology funds won't cut it, okay? They will not be suitable, they will not be willing to look at that stage. You will need to look at uh, other funding sources. Recently, Bayrak's National Biopharma Mission has gone into this space, okay, for the first time. Otherwise, Bayrak stops before when you hit manufacturing, okay? And if you're expanding and growing, then you have to look at private money. The guys who already have established businesses and are just expanding, so for example, there are a lot of medical device companies in India today which are already in business their only task is that they want to set up US FDA approved facilities and go global and scale up, right? That's where all the large private equity firms kick in, okay? They come in at that stage, okay? To do the, finance the growth. Hmm? And of course, if you're very profitable, you're in a position to go for IPOs and bank loans, okay? Some of these are open in Venture Center as well right now. I want to leave you with a couple of final thoughts, okay? So for investors, many of you should at least have a sense of a few things that bug them or they would be concerned about, okay? So investors were asked like what they feel challenged, uh, you know, them, what keeps you awake at night? That's the question, okay? So the top on the list is a mismatch in valuation expectations between investors and firm owners. I'm not surprised. Uh, this is what is negotiated, right? <laughs> so that you have to, uh, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but just keep in mind that that is a concern for them, okay? The second is maintaining their high level of returns, right? See, they, they work as a portfolio and they don't know which one is going to succeed and they need to have a few winners to show that kind of returns and if they don't succeed, they will, the investors won't give them the next round of money for them to invest. So they have that concern as well, just like you have a concern about your own company. So you have to worry about these kind of activities. I mean, when you're thinking about investors, be sensitive to their concerns, right? That's what often decides whether your wavelengths match or not, right? It's nice to work with somebody who understands that I'm putting in money because I have to make money. So you be careful about how you use my money to make money, right? If, if the person on the other side looks too flippant, okay, or doesn't show the same level of concern, okay, or appreciation of this, it is a problem, okay? So you, you have to be clear. You can't don your scientist hat 
at the time and say that this is great science. What are you talking about? He'll say, tell me with what certainty you can make money. That's what he's asking you. Okay? Okay. Another very important problem in startups is very often the issue of leadership, co-founders, and team. Okay? That is one of the top issues we also see makes hell a lot of difference. If you want to focus on one single thing besides your rest of your business, it is building your team. Okay? Very often, single entrepreneurs are they too risky for our investors. They want to see a team. Okay? And they want to see the team committed and getting along. Co-founders disputes are also common. Okay? And that is one of the top issues that investors will flag as something that makes the system work or not. Okay? So two things which you should keep in mind. And I think with that, I will close this session. Um, any burning questions? Yeah. Yeah, so one has to take a practical view of this. Um, it's easy to say that you need to have team members, but you know you know the difficulty in bringing team members, right? So a couple of thumb rules I would say is, in my opinion, it's easier to bring, this is my view, Shrikant will add his view because he's more experienced than me on this. My view is it's easier to bring good team members a little earlier in the game, okay? Contrary to what you might think, right? After you have done a lot of hard work, got money in and so on and so forth, you start thinking of too much about what that guy's contribution we will be versus what you're going to do and all that bickering starts happening, right? Very often, uh, the second point I would like to make is very often you find co-founders from people, amongst people, uh, who you have met in some other context and have known and been with them without this immediate issue or this, you know, any selfish intention or a transaction in mind, right? That's why if it's a friend of yours from many years who you have known in a context very different from this immediate transaction in mind, it sort of seems to work. But that said, the team has to be covering all the critical to success factors, right? So in every business, there are different aspects which are important at different stages of the business. In the very early stages, you may be able to focus only on technology and a little bit of fundraising, right? But as things change, you might have to start focusing on sales, marketing, distribution. The level of fundraising changes. The networks needed are different. So. In every business, the art is to identify what is critical to success and who can do it, okay? I'm saying who can do it, okay? Not necessarily who's the best to do it because, uh, you know, there's a very interesting video online of Jack Ma talking, don't look for the best guys, okay? Uh, look for people who, who can actually do the job. At the end of the day, you need to work with people who are available to you. But that said, it's good to fill up those gaps. At least, if not them being entirely experienced in that in the beginning, even if you can find people who are oriented in that direction and are interested in doing that role and are committed to it, that's itself an advancement. Okay? Okay, now, there has to be a combination of employees, consultants, mentors, advisors, and so on. Usually, a very important ingredient in this is the vision that you're selling. That's why I told you that's very important to project that opportunity, right? People join you very often not because of immediate concerns, okay? They join you because it looks imaginative. It looks interesting, okay? It looks exciting for them. The impact sort of fits into their scheme of things in terms of what they wish to deliver. Of course, that is beyond the basic bare minimum. But that said, very often people join you for that reason, 
Okay? So remember that it's not merely transactional. Okay? It is actually about telling them a story. Right? That fits nicely into the next session where, um, where Shrikant will talk about it. But remember, it's not just your financial investors who are investing in your company. It's your fellow team members. It's, these are board members, mentors, okay? your employees, your customers. All are buying into that vision. Right? Very often, there might be just one guy who believes, I have to give this guy a chance in the market. Right? Let me buy his product. That guy is your champion. right? But it did not happen just because it was a transaction. It's because he sat in front of you, saw that spark in your eye, thought this product makes sense, let me give it a try. Okay? These kind of things are hard to put down on paper, right? But this is reality. This is how it works. That's how you build teams as well. Okay? We can talk more about it, but at this time, this is all that I can share with you. Any other questions? Uh we talked about financial investment, but sweat equity. I mean, we always are confused in the beginning. Uh, you talked about Jack Ma's uh, example. Uh, we are also confused. There are a lot of uh, value addition by people. Yeah. And they are also imaginative, but you know how to compensate them in a million dollars. So sh yeah. should we give them a sweat equity or should we, uh, you know, uh, what kind of commitment uh, usually yeah. should be uh, given in such conditions? Okay. When so still not in market. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll give you my opinion. Uh, my opinion is <laughs> that equity should be reserved only for people okay, who can make a significant difference in, to simplify it to the valuation of the company. Okay? If, and they have control over it. That means if they're in a role where they have no control in shaping the valuation of the company, I wouldn't consider them for equity. Okay? It is not a replacement for pay. Because the guys who are looking at short-term compensation will actually get frustrated when they realize that the shares have no liquidity. Okay? They, will, they cannot be cashed out. It takes time to make money and so on. So equity is only for those guys who are thinking long-term, not short-term, who can see them influencing valuation of the company okay? and making an impact at the end of the road. Right? So you have to be a little conservative as founders in doing that. Now, when you're compensating people, there are multiple ways of looking at it. Fixed compensation is one thing. You can also look at variable okay, in certain roles. For example, sales, marketing, and so on and so forth. You don't need to necessarily rely on equity. Okay? So people, I mean, I generally think that equity should not be used for, it's not necessarily compensation okay it is for people who want to participate in that vision and it's the upside for them okay if they if they stay with the vision right that's my thought right so sweat equity i have a different i mean i'm I, this is my view on it okay okay i think i'll stop here uh, uh, uh nikita is priya there for the administrative